Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to The Chronicles. And this is Rita Gadi, together with, I always describe him as the brightest mind this side of the planet, Omobono Adaza, my Mindanaoan province made, island made from, well, from all the way down south. Omobono Adaza, indeed. Bono's been an old friend, old in the sense that we go back all to ancient times, and this was <laughs> when? When we first had elections, uh, well, presidential 1965, and then all the way until 1986, and then thereafter, and all the way to the present. So here we are at this stage. We have our president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. in the United States, Washington, D.C., no less, together with uh, Japan and the United States signing an agreement known as the Trilateral. Three countries that are now uh, ironclad, as uh, President Biden has described themselves, in so far as the South China Sea is concerned, the waters beyond our islands, perhaps the Pacific Ocean, and the waters that surround the world. We are actually the planet three-fourths of water. So when Obama announced that Asia is the pivot, concern of the United States of America. America was then just about the only hegemon at the time. Russia was still navigating itself to be uh, both a military and economic power, and China was likewise moving onwards at that time. This was in 2011. 2011, we had an editorial. I was editing a daily broadsheet, and uh, we had an editorial which perhaps uh, a few paragraphs I'd like to read because this is timing, Bono, with what Obama said. Yeah, go ahead. We uh, go to the pivot in Asia. So this, this is actually the title, likewise, of our program. Threatening, taking, talking. <laughs> so you would see that there are threats around this area and the territories we're going to talk about. There is a taking. And hopefully, the solution would be for all of this, a talking. So in September 1974, when we joined the official Philippine delegation that first came to the People's Republic of China at the height of the Cold War and prior to our opening of diplomatic relations with that country, remember this was 1974, September, the 10 days of September, as a matter of fact. Chairman Mao Zedong was asked what his vision was for China. Actually, he, there was no interview that could be allowed uh, at the time, but uh, you know, we were able to shoot that question uh, as he was exiting from that meeting that he had with um, Mrs. Imelda Romualdez Marcos, our first lady at the time, and her son our president today, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. They were together in that particular historic meeting. So when he was asked, Chairman Mao, what is your vision for China? This was September, 1974. He clenched his fists and furtively beat his chest and said, our name, Zhang Gu, which we were, able to translate as the center kingdom of the world, Zhanggu, or Zhanggu, however else you pronounce it. So for centuries, even before recorded time, China has considered itself as the middle kingdom in a world that was still vastly unexplored, unclaimed, and uninhabited. From its last imperial regime, through the early and final decades of the communist cultural revolution of Mao Zedong, it has now emerged as a global supernation 
with one fourth of the world's human population fortifying its progressively powerful and military economy. Archaeological studies indicate that our country was loosely attached to the mainland through what was called then the land bridges. As a matter of fact, the tracing was done through the excavated bones of animals, fossils, and pottery unearthed in the northern and western villages of our country. In fact, as a gesture of friendship in that first visit to China, the Philippines gifted the People's Republic with ancient Chinese porcelain and clay vases dating back to the Tang and Sung dynasties, which were dug from the northern part of our country. Old Chinese maps with the cartography etches of the islands along the South China Sea indicating the busy travel from the mainland to our southernmost provinces decades before the imperial European sailors from Spain and Portugal landed in the Visayas Island along the Pacific coast, and they were just searching for spices, no intent to conquer, no intent to colonize. They were in search of spices. But our planet being two thirds water, the movements of the sea and the oceans have caused major changes in the topography of the world, size and positioning of peninsulas and smaller bodies of land surrounded by water. And all of these movements actually changed, well, in many ways, the topography of the planet. So we have the curvature of our peninsula and the smaller bodies of land surrounded our peninsula or what you call our archipelago. And the curvature of our 7,107 islands is evidence of the magnitude of this water movements where some of our islands are strewn around the bigger land mass. And then the fact that we have no borders except the sea is both a blessing and a bane. The fact that we have no borders except the sea is actually what I stated, a blessing because of the freedom of space and movement and a bane because of the jurisdictional measurement of islands that border the high seas or the water or what is known as the international waters, which cannot be owned because they're either geographically distant from the, from the land itself or they're considered common passage for international navigation. So that's how uh, the world looks like today. Our waters are actually being emptied by the most lethal forms of industrial fishing and being poisoned by the heartlessness of seagoing vessels that spill polluted waste along their trail. There ought to be an international bill of rights for the non-human forms of life that exist in the waters, just as there is or there ought to be the responsibility of voluntary regulation and global fishing in the high seas and the so-called international waters, which are erroneously classified as for anyone to abuse. So the waters around us are not only the physical management of commercial or ecosystems, it is essentially a spiritual center where the harmony of life and landscape is sacred for our future. The waters embody the voice of our universal soul and remains the legacy of humanity's constant ethic of love for world peace. This is where the idea of a global village is an idea painfully searching for a common link with all of humanity, either through diplomacy or economics, or in the modern age through the phenomenon of the internet, cybernetics, as they would call it. And since our planet is water-based, it is crucial that we enhance the use of our waters, not just for transport of goods, but more importantly, for the transport of peace. Water is the common physical link. And the symbol of water as the balancing element of the universe gives us this amazing capacity to equalize and to give what is due 
and to share what is just. And so the South China Sea that passes alongside our entire coastline between Asia mainland was once a river channel of deep warm waters dexterously uh, sailed by bamboo rafts from the ancient China and from Japan. Today, it continues to be a major corridor for the commerce of, well, the Americas, Asia, the Mediterranean, and Europe. Our strategic location, the strategic location of our islands, is that of a revolving door, where one enters into our islands to get into the east or enters into our islands to get into the west. The Philippines is the entrance and the exit of two worlds connected by the 64 million square miles of the Pacific. And so it is the waters in the South China Sea that bring the roots of commerce, creed, and cultures in and out of our shores. It is the waters that weave the fabric of our lives with the threads of the human soul, even as we fashion our own destiny within ourselves and within the Pacific Basin. The waters too should teach us and our neighbors the gift of peace. It would be purposeful to remember that it is the waters that form our nation state as an archipelago and our geography is not an error of history. As Chairman Mao Zedong once said, when he first visited the People's Republic of China 30 years ago, I'm sorry, when we first visited China 30 years ago or more, 50 years ago for that matter, this was what Mao Zedong said. And he told this to Mrs. Marcus, our first lady. You can change religion and ideology anytime, but you cannot change geography. So let this understanding then be like peace, the beginning of all possibilities. So this I wrote in 2011 at about the time that President Obama after the ASEAN conference and after his statements addressed the world saying that Asia is now the pivot, the hegemon America declaiming us as such. Now, what do we have? Now we have, well, the Pacific, the territorial waters occupying the surface of the earth, which is about, how big is this? Well, two thirds of our planet, as a matter of fact. 166 square kilometers, far exceeding the total land area of the planet itself. It is the largest region of life. But that ocean spills into, across our islands, into the South China Sea. So here you have the waters from Antarctica to the Bering Strait and across the coasts of of uh, Colombia in South America to the Malay Peninsula in Asia along the line of islands extending from Sumatra through Java to Timor and from Timor to the Cape Londonderry in Australia, the Bass Strait and on to the to Tasmania northward to the, well, to the coastlines of the Asia mainland and then the Philippine Islands and then Korea, Japan, China and Russia. So you could see how the waters really surround all of us. And so we have this geographical location beyond the Pacific Ocean on the other side of our island, which we now call the South China Sea. I do not know where they got the name West Philippine Sea. It is a name that is not registered anywhere except in the words of people who talk about it. But it is still considered as the South China Sea. So what do we have today? Well, you have three leaders of three nations in Asia, two of them, Japan and the Philippines. And then you have the United States of America president meeting in Washington for a trilateral, but with a main concern in so far as they are concerned and the statements that have been made by the president of America himself, which is the security of this navigational highway we now call the South China Sea. So Bono, what do you make out of this trilateral? 
it's a lot of words, <laughs> trilateral. Because uh, I'm wondering whether they can do anything after this trilateral meeting. Thus far, only exercises. And you're saying that uh, West Philippine Sea is a word invented by <laughs> some people here, but it became an international accepted word after the PCA decision. The arbitral tribunal decision mentions directly West Philippine Sea, other than the South China Sea. Now, Biden said the assurance is ironclad. <clears throat> Let's see about that. <laughs> because, you know, the history of the United States with respect to alliances is not a very happy one. And let me recite certain instances. Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang were supported by the United States of America. When Mao, Chu Enlai, and Chu Ti fought Chiang Kai-shek, and Chiang Kai-shek went to Formosa, now known as Taiwan, America was now ready to be found. Okay. In, in Vietnam, let's talk about Asia. In Vietnam, America fought for Mod Indium and Van Thieu. They abandoned both Mod Indium and Van Thieu. And Ho Chi Minh, Van Tien Dong, and Vong Nguyen Gap took over the uh, Vietnam. In the. Vietnam, yes. In, in, yes, in America itself, uh, <laughs> Rita, 30 to 35 minutes away from Miami is Havana of Cuba. One of the favorites of the United States before was Batista, who was the president of Cuba, a dictator actually of Cuba. But when Castro and Che Guevara fought, that's a ragtag army, fought Batista. And when Batista was on the run, America was nowhere in sight. And very recent ones. Afghanistan, you know, the, the Afghans fought not only for themselves, but for the United States of America. And a ragtag army, the Taliban, drove America out of Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is nowhere in sight. I'm glad that they're still supporting Ukraine. And they are wavering, as a matter of fact, in the Middle East. They are wavering in the Middle East. So I hope that the assurance of Biden, ironclad, has a different meaning from these instances of alliances of the United States of America, which it abandoned. Now, this ironclad, we have been bombarded, no? Bombarded by uh, water cannons. And I didn't even see the United States of America at that time. Several times, four times, bombarded by cannons. Browner was not there. Gibo was not there. The Secretary of National Defense. The TOCA type members of the military were not there. And the TOCA type members of the cabinet were not there either. Why didn't they fight back against this uh, uh, Chinese Coast Guard? Where was our Navy? Where were the airplanes of the Philippine Air Force? When under Section 3 of Article 2 of the Constitution, the goal of the Armed Forces of the Philippines is to secure the sovereignty of the state and the integrity of the national territory. Where were they? It's always press releases, words, words, and words. And as a matter of fact, before the president departed for the United States, the speaker, the secretary of national defense, the, the chief of top the armed forces, the Philippines said, the people should defend our country. No, they should defend it first because they are not doing their duties under the constitution. My suggestion is all of these guys man the boats, civilian flotillas, they all go to the West Philippine Sea 
until then, what, what's the reason for us to follow, follow them? They are not the pipe, piper of Hamelin, and we're not <laughs> lemmings. We're not lemmings. So they should sue us first. Members of the cabinet, the whole House of Representatives, Senate, governors, mayors, military, I will see how they can protect us in the West Philippine Sea. And I will be the first, Rita, to march for them if they do that kind of fighting. You know, I was listening to the whole speech of, of Kishida. And Kishida had the more interesting insight into the situation. And Kishida said, we are fighting for freedom and democracy in the world. And she, China, uh, America is the bacon, is the leader for the preservation of democracy and freedom in the world. And Japan is standing side by side with the United States of America. You know, almost every sentence of Kishida was given a standing ovation by the American Congress. And even the statements, he said that the defense of democracy and freedom in the world should be supported by bipartisan Congress in the United States of America. And he got the standing ovation. Now, let's see what's going to happen, whether China will start bombarding us again with water cannons. You know, at the very beginning, when we were bombarded with water cannons, why don't they use their heads? We should have bombarded them also, not with water cannons, but the influence of Malabanan. And let's see <laughs> what will be the reaction. Let's see. No, no, we should be more, more uh, creative. <laughs> In uh, in doing our fighting with the limited resources we have, we have yes. plenty of that. Yes, yes, you have plenty of that here, and we'd like to see how they will react. China could bring militias to the West Philippine Sea. Why can't we bring or bring also our militia fishermen to the West Philippine Sea? But the Speaker, the President, the Senate, Congressmen, uh, members of the Cabinet, governors, mayors. Military, they should be with them. Because why leave the defense of the country to us poor souls who don't have arms? <laughs> All we can think of are creative ideas, and they don't even adopt our creative ideas. <laughs> so let's see after the president comes back here what's going to happen in the West Philippine Sea. And and you know, he's always talking about unity and dialogue. In really is just a wallflower. Let's start dialogue here in the in the Philippines when he comes back. Call the people who are who are in the opposition. Let's talk Turkey. Okay, defense of the country. Let's talk Turkey, and we will tell him, Mr. President. Some of the members of your cabinet are useless. Example of that. Example, a concrete example. The House of Representatives issued a warrant for Pastor Apollo Kibaloy. The Senate issued the warrant. A court in Dabao issued the warrant. A court in uh, Pasig issued the warrant. All that we get are press releases. Press releases from NBI, from police. They're not doing anything. You know what Duterte, what President Duterte has been saying, former President Duterte has been saying, he said that Kibuloy is just there. <laughs> in, in, he's just there. And why can't they arrest you? And the whole government is a laughing stock. The president, when he comes back here, he should he should start conversing with you, with the others. I don't care if he doesn't <laughs> converse with me. Uh, I, I mean, just write my books, write my columns, <laughs> write my poems. But he should converse with many creative people here in the Philippines who could tell him straight on his face that something is wrong somewhere. Something is wrong somewhere. So let's so, let's get back to a little bit of history as far as this is concerned. Yes. These water cannons that, uh, that are being uh, spewed how do we call this? When they're they're being they they're canonizing. That's a bad word. 
Slaughter <laughs> cannons actually began when? It began... Uh, no, after. After, after, after the, Duterte. After because Duterte. They did not because use now, water cannons. Yeah. Yeah, but before, yeah, the, during Duterte's time, there were no water cannons. Yes, none. We have this uh, dilapidated, deteriorating Sierra Madre, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Second World War um, remnant that was uh, given by the Americans for I don't know what reason, but which we used as some kind of a block, blockade dow. Imagine one boat to block the entire China Sea, or that particular area where you have all these little islands that are supposed to be protected. And of course, the the place where you have a lot of fish, and that's where our fishermen want to go. Okay, so prior to uh, Marcus Jr. entering office, there were no incidents of water cannons. Yes. There were a lot of other incidents, uh, you know, Oh, they would want to go there. They they placed a flag, etc. They placed schoolhouses and so forth. They would bring supplies. They would refurbish. Uh, there's some 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 fixing up, just so long as it will not completely sink. Or you know, you had something like a community of soldiers there, but they say there are only eight or eighteen, whatever number there is. So, and then the president at a press conference in Washington announced that. He did not know what was happening because it seemed there was some kind of a secret deal between President Duterte and the President of China, Xi Jinping. Uh, early on, before he left for the trilateral, he was said he said he was horrified by uh, whatever uh, document or agreement there was between the, the two presidents, but in the same sentence he said but he has not read it nor has he seen the document but he is horrified that there is now he seems to be confirming the fact that he got the confirmation from the chinese embassy itself so i don't know in washington from what chinese embassy there was that he got confirmation for the press release that indeed there was some secret deal you know. as he was as, <laughs> yeah, as he was saying this uh, President Duterte also held a press conference denying that there was anything as far as a deal and an agreement is concerned between him and President Xi Jinping. Yes, we talked, he said. We talked about the South China Sea. We we talked about a status quo that we don't, uh, we try not to uh, irritate each other in the sense that uh, do not start sending uh, whatever it is, materials in the Sierra Madre, why don't we agree to tow it so that you don't have that dilapidated thing, etc. Many things, but this was all verbal. This was not written. And of course, our president got horrified at this. I mean, you know, Duterte is a lawyer. He would discuss uh, the navigation of <laughs> highway, which is so vital, and the islands that uh, are there in that highway. And he did not have this written down. But that's yeah. the way Duterte is, actually. He is also a man of words in many ways, half human, half words. And so are <laughs> many others of our leaders also in the same uh, mode. But that was how it was. Rita. So there is nothing written, but our present president is horrified at whatever there is between an understanding of the two presidents are concerned. Rita. So where does that leave us now? He will they, come home and will emphasize on a secret deal which does not exist in writing. Verbally, it is out there in the air, the way, the way airwaves after they just float between uh, minds, etc. So where does that leave our country as far as the pronouncement of Duterte denying that there was anything written and anything that could be detrimental to our country's security? And there was the admission by our present president that we have to get into the nitty gritty fact of this secret thing that may have occurred between the two heads of state. So, Rita, the problem started with a talkative member of the cabinet of Duterte. It was Harry Rocky who first mentioned about the gentleman's <laughs> agreement. And then another talkative member of the cabinet, Panelo, both of them come from the University of the Philippines, by the way. And I'm not proud of it. 
the panel said there is no such thing. <laughs> now, the headlines of inquirer said there was an agreement according to Duterte between him and Xi Jinping about, about the Sierra Madre. The agreement is not to have it repaired. That's the agreement according to Duterte. But you know, the main problem is it's difficult to believe Duterte and Duterte doesn't also believe in the president. So whom we, do we believe? There are a concrete example now based on this current discussion. Duterte said that the president is in drugs. The president said Duterte is also in drugs. <laughs> Exchange of accusation. You know, in, in legalist, that's interlocking confession. This one now, you know, Duterte <laughs> should, should talk to Rocky and Panelo to keep their mouth shut because he is giving the, both of them are giving him trouble because this is started with them. We're, we're it not for Harry <laughs> Rocky saying that there's a gentleman's agreement. Nobody in the world would have raised the issue of gentleman's agreement, not even the president, because none, of, none exists. But Harry says it exists, and Panilo says it does not exist, which is with what is what. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're here in, at this particular situation and this national concern as a matter of fact so that a trilateral had to be convened in order to address what it has been termed now as the aggressiveness of china now a china being aggressive there are islands there are islets that have been converted into islands they have been reclaimed there are, well we also have one runway there uh, you have the Pagasa group of islands, and then you have the shoals, you have the reefs, you have the rocks, etc. And then you have the islets, I, islets, islands around that area close to Palawan, Pagasa, as you would call it, and several other names, but they could be referring to the same group of, uh, well, rocks and shoals. So what is a shoal that we are trying to defend? You can't even live there. A shoal, <laughs> I look at the definition... A shoal is a natural submerged ridge and it is covered by sand. That's a shoal. We have a reef, which is a ridge of jagged rock above sea level or at the sea surface, and they form sandbars or uh, what they call um, shallow water bars. Then you have well, the islets, the little islands there the in, in Pagasa, which, what a name, you know, hope for that matter, that we're still hoping you could occupy it. And I think there are uh, people actually um, living there. So we have here our armed forces, our Secretary of National Defense, and all the other departments rising to the call of aggression over this, the shoal, the reef. Uh, the sandbars and these islands. When we have here and the home brand in our archipelago, 7,107 islands. Uh, let's say 5,000 of them are habitable and surrounding these islands. You could fish there if only we would be giving our fishermen the kind of uh, necessary equipment and boats, etc., and storage storage for their harvest for their harvest of sea creatures, then we do not have to go all the way out there to, to fish on these reefs, shoals, etc. go into the International Court of Justice or whatever to start claiming all of the sandbars, reefs, and shoals and spending, well, whatever it is. I, I, I'm, I am batting the breeze as far as this is concerned, Bono, because it has now come to the attention of the world that because of these reefs, shoals, islets, and all of these little islands there out into 212 nautical miles away, 800 nautical miles away. The question of definition of whether they're sovereign of territory or we have sovereign rights. And then you have uh, an arbitration which cannot 
actually rule on anything except that they don't believe that China owns the China Sea. It did not even tell us that we owned these islands and this. No, it, it made no declaration. It went back to the United Nations Conference Convention on the Law of the Sea. It went back to the navigational laws. So that's what we have. All of this floating in the water, Bono. And we're either sinking or swimming or what is surfacing. So you have the threats coming from, well, according to the trilateral, coming from China because of the water cannons. And then there is this funny threat that uh, we have to defend uh, the northern part of our country because China might invade or is is a position to invade Taiwan. Again, the question arises, why will China invade a province of China, which is Taiwan? As you said, America was not able to defend, uh, you know, the, 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 the exit of the Chinese from the mainland to Formosa. And so that's why you have Ch Taiwan. But nonetheless, mainland China or Beijing or the head of China's government has agreed you can live on your own. That's why they have their own kind of government, the way Hong Kong and Macau likewise have their own uh, democratic processing as far as their government is concerned. So, But there is the threat that we are being um, subjected to. That is why, in addition to the military defense treaty, uh, after 2011, after Obama announced the pivot of Asia, then we now have to have the enhanced defense uh, coordinating something, the EDCA. Okay. In, initially, you had five. And then when President Jr. came into power, then an additional four. And they are located in strategic positions, as I said, one in the north, because just in case mainland China would invade Taiwan, and then the other air bases, Philippine bases, as a matter of fact, strategically positioned so that just in case China would invade us, again, the question goes, why would China invade us? So the question is, is China an enemy? <laughs> so there it goes now. No, Bono. No. Rita, that is where all of this is floating in the waters. I'll answer your question <laughs> by saying this conversation I had with a fellow Chinoy who normally goes to Beijing and comes back here. And I, I was complaining when Duterte said, it's better for us to have the Philippines become a province of China. And then he, he, he retreated. No, I was only joking. <laughs> I was only joking. I complained, you know, joke or not, the Philippines should never be a colony again of the United States. Neither should it become a province of China. Bon, why are you complaining? The Philippines is already a province of China. The, the air transportation is controlled by Chinese. The uh, subdivisions are controlled by Chinese. The banks are controlled <laughs> by Chinese. Everything, the uh, corporate trade is controlled by Chinese. The uh, sea transportation controlled by the Chinese. What are you complaining about? Even gambling is not controlled by the Chinese. <laughs> the Philippines is already a province of China, so stop complaining. <laughs> you know, I almost, I almost laughed when he told me this. But I said, you know, you may be right, but one day, one day, there will come a time when that provision in Article 2 of the Constitution, that the Philippines should develop a Filipino-controlled economy. It says, it states there, if that is a declaration of principles, how can you possibly amend other provision without amending that general principle in Article 2? You cannot amend the uh, letting foreigners enter into the Philippines without amending that particular provision. That's why I'm almost, <laughs> I'm almost tempted, except for the fact that my niece are paining me <laughs> to bring these people to the ombudsman <laughs> and their section one of Article 11 of the Constitution <laughs> and under Art 
Section 1 of Article 2 be considered and several other provisions. And I'd like to see how they will defend themselves. They are saying they are Filipinos. They love this country. Okay, they love this country. Prove it. I want proof that they love this country. Because at the rate we are going, these guys are not saying, are not demonstrating love of country. They just want us <laughs> to defend the country. Why don't they do it first? They don't do their duties. Let them go to the West Philippine Sea, all of them. I'll contribute whatever little money I have. Maybe I'll sell my house in Cagayan de Oro and <laughs> contribute that money for them to all go to the West Philippine Sea. And then I'll wait for the results. And I'll tell you <laughs> when the results are in, let's march for them. Because they've already proved that they love this country. And they are willing, in the words of Nino Aquino, uh, the, the country is worth dying no, for. No, for. I told Nino, I'm not going to die for the country because to die for the country, the rascals will win, according to George Patton, one of the best generals of the United States of America in the Second World War. When you die for your country, your enemy wins. So don't die your, for your country. Kill for your country. That's what you should do in time of war. And as of now, there is no declared war between China and, and us. There's none. But there is a state of war. These are two different things. Yes. Yeah, there is no declar declared war, but there is a state of war. Now, question. So many people here are not doing their job. Are they not violating, uh, endorsing the idea, as a matter of fact, of compromising with China? Are they not violating Article 114 of the Revised Penal Code on treason? Because the, word, the words of that provision does not say that you need a declaration of war. A state of war, yes. <laughs> you, you know, there are so many interesting questions that can be raised, but I have no time to do it except with you here because it's more interesting <laughs> here than going it going to to the Supreme Court or anywhere else. No? Yes, let us hope that uh, enough people would be listening and also those who are actually in the seats of power so that they're uh, moving around in their swivel chairs to consider also part of our history as far as this is concerned. That's why I was asking the question. When did when did this water cannon um, thing occur? You know, so why did it occur at that at that particular point in time? Because because of that pivot to Asia and then the beginning of EDCA, for that matter, where you had this uh, enhanced uh, well enhanced uh, et defense, defense um, yeah. collaboration with the uh, with uh, the United States of America, but. As you said, there is not yet war, but we already have the state of war now. It is quite alarming, as far as my sense is concerned, for the president of the United States of America, not just to emphasize that word ironclad, as you said, talagang bakal, pero kinakalawang din yung bakal in case he did it. <laughs> but when he said, you know, <laughs> but when, because... <laughs> that is where I, I'm leading on to something as far as agreements are concerned. Because, for example, and dami daming pinipirmahan, yeah. Sabi nga ni Junior Marcos, Duterte is a brilliant lawyer, or at least a very competent lawyer, bakit hindi sinulat, etc. In all of these agreements, treaties, speeches, statements, lahat ng yan, you know what they forget? They forget the moral and the cultural aspect the moral and the cultural aspect, which is so important. Military, economic, progress, lahat yan, development. Yeah, ang ganda pakinggan. But the ethical standard of all of these agreements, I've mentioned this, I think, as I said in that editorial I read in 2011. Yun ang wala. Wala yun. They did not consider that we are a global community. We are one human race, my goodness. Ano ba yan? As you said, words, words, words. Now let's trace back all of these words. What I said, what you said, Bono, and I'd like to continue from there, we are in a state of war. 
which was further emphasized by this ironclad phrase of beat Biden when he said that should there be any attack on any vessel, etc., um, you know, in the South in the South China Sea, um, they he will invoke or you know it it, it will be the in, he will invoke the military defense treaty, but the military defense treaty states that the United States will come to the assistance of the Philippines if our metropolitan territory is attacked or if our armed forces are attacked in the Pacific area. That is the original 1951 provision in the Pacific area. Now, if you will consider what happened in 1991, that they've named the South China Sea also as the Indo-Pacific region. Tuloy-tuloy. So yung tubig na nanggagaling sa Pacific Ocean na dumadaloy din sa ating mga islands na pumapasok dyan sa South China Sea, kasama na rin yan dyan. 1991, Amerika na rin na nagsabi in the same manner na ginamit na rin yung terminology ng West Philippine Sea. But, this was emphasized also by that speech of President Marcos, the metropolitan area of either the United States attacked by an enemy of both the United States and the Philippines, or the Philippines likewise attacked. Pero yung vessels so sa Pacific Ocean at dito sa South China, wala yan dun eh. Kaya dyan sa EDCA nila pinasok yan. See? That, uh, well... This is supposed to help us in our defense, etc., and all of whatever it is. Then again, <laughs> that mutual defense treaty is 1951. Siguro inisip ni Biden na ang tiba-tiba niyang bakal na yan, yung ironclad na yan. Several times, there have been attempts actually to amend it, to do something about it. Hindi na natuloy-tuloy. Kasi gusto ng Amerika ganyan na lang. Kasi ayon yan eh. <laughs> well, of course, sabi ko nga, hindi nila alam na kagaya ng Sierra Madre, pwedeng kinakalawang na rin yan. So it really needs, I Rita. don't know, kailangan Rita. hasain ng counter, whatever. Rita. But Marcos himself, 99 years ang occupation ng Amerika sa Clark and Subic, he reduced it to 25. Kasi... Nakuha din niya yung ideya, yung kipinag-usapan mo nga, Bono, Cuba. Panakuha nila Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. 30 years of ownership, of possession is ownership. That was what Fidel Castro said. So doon, sabi na alarma si Marcos, aba, magta-30 years na yata itong <laughs> ano na ito. So he reduced it now to 25 years. And a review of the military defense treaty every five years, which never happened, kahit na may review. Pero hindi nangyari kasi umabot na ng 1992 yung 25 years na yon. So the senators at the time, even though Mrs. Aquino was rallying and demonstrating and asking for the extension of this basis, wala nang nagawa kasi Salonga and all the so-called nationalists said hindi na they will not renew the basis agreement anymore. So tinapos sa 1992, not by their own hand, but because it was Marcos Sr. who said, hanggang 25 years na lang, review it. Then if you want to extend it, extend it. If you want to have a new one, then write a new one. But they never did. So tapos in, five, in 1992. So that's Great. what happened. Now Great. we have nine bases in addition to what was lost, supposedly lost in Clark and Subic, we have nine bases now which are occupied by American personnel, pre-positioned equipment and other facilities of which are, are not defined in any of the provisions of the EDCA. So I will not mention anymore where they're located, but it is enough that I have repeated this a hundred times every time I talk about EDCA. So, Rita. Bono, that's our situation. That yeah. is the state of war. Uh, let me tell you <laughs> my experience. In the, co -op, in the plan co of 89, I was on my way to the United States. I was in London. And 
I was supposed to sign the extension of the basis agreement with the United States with the view that the United States will support the coup. That was in oh, wow. 1989. <laughs> That's a big bargain, okay. yeah. Okay, and then Mr. Gregorio Nassan, who became senator, pulled the coup on December 1 instead of doing it on December 7. December so, 2. Yeah, the, no, December 2, here. It's yeah. December 1 in, in, in London. I was in London. London, and okay. He pulled it on December 2 instead of December 7. Yes. That's that was my agreed. mother's birthday. That's why I remember that date. Uh, that's oh. agreed, December 7. So yeah. I could not go to the United States anymore to sign the extension of the basis because he pulled the coup earlier and yeah. the American decided to support Corey. And yeah. that's why Hunasan and the guys lost. Not us, uh, because I was not a part of that coup anymore. Yeah. Okay, so that, uh, that, is, that is the, well, those are the... Uh, I don't have an adjective for it, but uh, I am writing that book, as a matter of fact, my invented coup d'etat. In fact, that's the title. It's fiction. So um, maybe if you can read it, then you would know my no. opinion and my I, I'm writing. I'm writing the version of the coup on the leadership okay, level. Good. I'm writing the fiction part of it. Oh, oh good. <laughs> on the leadership level. On the leadership good, level. Yes composition of the leadership, what really happened, etc. So that's our situation now, Bono. There are threats coming from, or at least uh, uh, threats which are imagined or horrifying or <laughs> actual. There is a taking of certain territories which are claimed by so many countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Brunei, the Philippines, and even Taiwan and China, for that matter. And then finally, there is the talking. As you said, there is too much too much words being brought out by people who are not supposed to be doing the talking. But there has to be the talking that is very important between heads of state, whether this talking is going to be written, Bono, or whether the talking is supposed to be some kind of a gentleman's agreement, as President Jr. has mentioned or whether the talking could be able to solve the situation as it is. Because that also brings me back to the Malacca Straits, where you have three countries that are fighting over that narrow, narrow, <laughs> narrow strip of water, which is the main passageway of all the oil imports of Japan, of all of these countries of now of China, and all the other countries that are uh, getting their oil from the Middle East. So you're passing to that narrow Malacca Strait out into the Indian Ocean, up to the Mediterranean, and then the Suez Canal, and then open to the Middle Eastern countries where you get your oil supply. And in the same manner, your products, which are being produced, also pass that same Malacca Strait. You have three countries there. And up to this day, even though they already have some kind of an agreement as what to do, in other words, are they going to control the size and the weight of the cargo ships that are passing there, commercial or otherwise? Are military ships also going to be allowed to pass? And who is going to do the controlling and the rule of law when you have three countries that are fighting and are being traversed by that little, little narrow strip? Now we have this huge South China Sea, which is also the navigational highway. It's the front door of China, one of the biggest commercial uh, entities in this part of the world, of Japan, of South Korea, and several other countries in the ASEAN, 10 member countries, who are a little squirming, not a little, but are squirming in a way, <laughs> without expressing, without talking, without taking, without threatening, but squirming that something is happening in Washington, and they're not a part of it. But we have a leader there of ASEAN, our president, who's part of it. So does he carry now the beacon and say, I am the David that can be able to fight all the terrors and monsters of the world, whichever way it goes. Bono, that's the talking we're waiting for, and let's hope for the best. Yeah, the best is yet to come. 
But <laughs> if they do the fighting that I mentioned, the protection for this country, I will watch from Kagehen de Oro <laughs> how successful can they do it. You know, as you mentioned that, Bono, I just saw a, a picture of the uh, president of the Senate, um, uh, Mix. Senator Subiri, in full uniform, not battle gear, but in full uniform, reporting to the microphone and to the world with uh -huh. a salute that he is now uh, one of the reserve officers corps that, yeah. is, that, is willing, that is willing to defend. So maybe... He heard you when you said that they should be the frontliners as far as the defense of the Pagasa, Ayungin Shoal, etc., and all of the other shoals and reefs and rock, uh, <laughs> rocks, etc., that we are actually defending with the Coast Guard, the uh, Philippine Army, Philippine Navy, or whatever else there is. Um, not enough uh, ammunition, but as you said, we could have alternative ammunition, yes. water cannons, and we have cannons from Malabana. Uh, let's call it as it should be called my goodness what a dirty word if we have to call it that but that That's... is the way as you said if we cannot do anything otherwise what is a slingshot compared to the mighty goliath for that matter so bono that's the situation the state of war that we're actually in let's wait for the return of the president and let's see what he intends to do based on the trilateral agreement with Biden well, and Kishida. The trilateral has opened so many promises as a matter of, not promises, but there are actually a number of uh, partnerships for the global infrastructure and investment answer to Russia's One Belt, One Road. That's what they call it. They call it the... Uh, Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. It is what they call the answer to the uh, One Belt, One Road of President Xi Jinping. And there would be an office that they intend to establish here in our country, for that matter. Can you imagine how the former President Duterte has invited twice to the mainland or three times already precisely for this one built, one road, and now we will have an answer to that for the Asia Pacific region here in our country. And then they will also open what is known as the radio access network, the RAN communication, also here in the Philippines, which will open to be able to have uh, or to allow the different companies to offer their, uh, well, their, 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 the telecommunication systems, etc., and also for sharing uh, their base stations and so forth, and the, the telecom services and providing more uh, of their, um, well, what you call the major players also coming in. And this is from the United States of America, Japan, and of course here from our country. They would also establish the Indo-Pacific Disaster um, Relief hub here in our country and they will seek to integrate um, Japan into our defense industrial base and also well I, I, I'm writing it down as it was announced there in the trilateral that we also have a Japan America Philippines to uh, have a, some joint cyber defense network against China Russia North Korea so this is ideological I think this is already this is already fraud. You know, you know Rita, the Cold Rita, War has already ended Rita, eight years ago. That is a vision for colonization. Well, isn't all these moves <laughs> actually part of it? In in a way, it just has a different name. Yeah. And then, of course, you have the AUKUS, which is Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Well, you now have a Great Britain. <laughs> do we, do we still call it Great Britain? No, we call it the United Kingdom now giving us that's One why of their most sophisticated uh, aircraft carriers. I am suggesting to our, yes. I'm and suggesting course, to the president talk, and then you have, yeah? talk with the yeah. people who are interested to maintain this country as an independent from anyone, from any 
influence that will make this country either a province or a colony again of any one country. Okay, so that is all included in that big statement of President Biden that any attack on the Philippines in the South China Sea would be an opportunity to activate the Military Defense Treaty. I think someday we should really get a review of the Military Defense Treaty and find out what it actually has. Because even President Marcus Sr. has already mentioned, unless they attack and unless U.S. Congress agrees to help us, they will not come to save us because it will be an attack on the metropolit metropolitan area and an attack on the vessels out there in the Pacific Ocean, which in 1991, they considered the South China Sea as part of the Pacific Ocean. Kaya nga tinawag nilang Indo-Pacific. You know, hindi na tinawag na Philippine Pacific or China Pacific or whatever. It's the Indo-Pacific kasi meron na silang base doon eh, somewhere in the Indian Ocean. So, sinakop na lahat yan. The same waters that actually surround our planet Earth, as we said. We are all water. Rita, so, yes. my suggestion to the president is to talk with everybody in this country who has an idea of presenting an alternative solution, which is basically this country solution to what has been talked in Washington. There okay. are solutions to, to these problems right here. We don't have to depend on Japan and the United States of America. The solutions are here. So talk, Mr. President, to people like Rita. <laughs> oh, no. You don't have to talk to me. <laughs> because Rita, Rita is another talker. <laughs> we have this threatening, talking, um, taking, etc. No, so Rita, Rita is I'll, just a talker. I'll prepare a memo for you. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> I mean for you to, I will, to talk with the president. <laughs> on the 60th birthday of his father, I began the poem for his father dedicated at the time. Today oh. we salute a soldier. Okay. So that is exactly how we're supposed to go. But Bono, we're closing our program. But then again, as we've said, um, we are all talkers. We are all half human, half words. Um, people who should not be talking should really just keep silent. And people like me who keep on talking, listen to my silence. Because silence speaks far deeper and far stronger than all the words that we're expressing here. Bona writes, again, listen to the silence of his words. He has it. My poetry, perhaps, one day, if you, if you read my poem on the Philippine Revolution, that's exactly it. I call on all who answer to the honor of the name patriot. That is what we should be, first and foremost. So many definitions of what the nationalist is, what nationalism is, first and foremost, let us all be patriots. We wish the president Godspeed, safe voyage home, and we hope that whatever secret deals he's horrified with <laughs> will be settled once and for all, when he first talks to a pro former president, Duterte, just him, and then eventually talk outside of Japan and the United States to the biggest country this part of our planet, which is the People's Republic of China. So let us close with this prayer of Rabindranath Tagore. Thank you very much, Bono Adaza, for having joined us. Thank you. Thank you, too, for having me. Yes. So where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world is not broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving actually stretches its hands towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way, into that dreary sand of dead habit. Walk with us, O Lord, into that ever widening thought and action, that heaven of freedom. Our Father, 
let our country away. Amen. Thank you very much for having joined me, Bono. Thank you all those okay. who have listened to us. Please have yourself not just threatening, not just taking, but actually talking. Communication is still the art of civilization. God bless. God bless you all. Thank you. And this has been your Chronicles. And this is Rita Gadi. <laughs>